So Remington did not get into the bolt action rifle business just in 1962. They'd been in this business probably longer than any other American manufacturer. But during World War I, there were two factories making first the British Pattern 14 rifle, the U.S. Enfield, and those were at Eddystone and of course at Ilion, one in Delaware, one in New York. And literally they made millions of 1917s. They got to be very, very good at it. And more American Doughboys were issued the 1917 Enfield than the vaunted 03 Springfield. So the war ends, thankfully, and the contracts are canceled. Well, you have all this tooling. You have a workforce. What do you do? Well, Remington decided this bolt-action rifle, it's going to be a thing. And so they came out with a gun called the Model 30. The Model 30 is essentially a US Model 1917 rifle with all of its military extemporanea stripped away because it's going to be a sporting rifle. It's not going to be a military rifle. We can trim down the stock. We can, you know, slim it down a little bit by reducing the magazine capacity from six rounds to five. And it's still a good rifle and it fits more of what the commercial market is looking for, which is a hunting gun. In 1936, Remington's top competitor, Winchester, in this field, unveils what is undoubtedly the sportsman's rifle of the 20th century, the Winchester Model 70. And Remington knows that this is a gun to beat because Winchester has gone through and they've eliminated all of the bad elements that limit the inherent Enfield design from really reaching its full potential. And so Remington starts to look for ways to improve upon this design. And at this point, of course, the Second World War breaks out and commercial rifle development is functionally put on hiatus. However, in some of his time during the war, there's a Remington employee by the name of Mike Walker who tinkers with the Model 30 design and comes up with a refined, improved uh, design. And immediately following the war in 1947, Remington rolls this out as the Model 721. These guns soldier on, and they're, they're very nice rifles when you look at them, uh, but they just didn't quite have they didn't have quite the lines of the Model 70. They didn't have the reputation of the Model 70. And they were somewhat successful, uh, but they were very old school in how they were manufactured. And Remington knew that to compete against the Model 70, they needed a gun that was accurate, that was less expensive than the Winchester, um, and they needed something new. And that gun came in 1962, and we know it today as the Model 700. Interestingly, the Model 700 retained the Mike Walker trigger system. And so this trigger system, uh, which later became uh, the concern of a lot of trial attorneys and class action lawsuits, is the same trigger that had been in the 721. The trigger system actually predated the Model 700. And frankly, it's a pretty good trigger if you keep it maintained, you don't let it rust, you don't mess with it. When the Model 700 was introduced, Remington liked to advertise it as its famous three rings of steel for its strength, its, its uh, robustness uh, to guard against uh, chamber explosion, some things going wrong uh, that could injure the shooter behind all of this. Really, it was overbuilt, as most firearms are, and none of that was really necessary. It just plain works, and that's not going to happen anyway. Uh, it's your basic push-feed action with two opposed locking lugs. Real easy to make those up, uh, so you get some accurate and true faces, one to another, as you lock a round in the battery. It's got your basic button ejector. Real simple to open, real simple to operate. If a little force is needed, the gun is robust enough it can take that to try to clear some jams or some other problems. It's a real open design as all bolt actions are. It's real easy to see what's going on. So when you open the bolt and look down into it, all the workings, everything that, that picks up a cartridge, chambers a cartridge, extracts a cartridge and ejects that spent case, all those mechanisms for feeding, firing and ejecting that case are seen at a quick glance. 
and makes the bolt action, particularly the Model 700, uh, tremendously easy to understand. There were two basic models offered early on. Eventually there would be hundreds of variations, but two basic models were the ADL, which was a planar blind magazine version, and then the BDL, which was the deluxe version. It had contrasting four-end tip and grip cap, white line spacers. There was a fancy floor de lis checkering pattern early on. A lot of the models were finished with a very high gloss finish that was popular and made it stand out at the gun stores. And Remington uh, was smart also in, with both models. They used pretty good walnut early on in those models and that really was something that caught the buying public's attention too. When they came on the scene with a Model 700, they had something that could compete with Winchester. It was somewhat less costly to produce. It was sold at somewhat of a lesser price. And despite the fact that it didn't have the Winchester's uh, controlled round feed action and Mauser claw extractor, which were traditional and classic features, the Model 700 was successful, it, it, partly because of its price and partly because it, it it exhibited fine quality and it had other attributes that Remington made quite a lot out of. What differentiates the 700 from previous models, in particular the Model 721, is instead of using a forged and machined receiver, it's a cylindrical receiver, which means that it can be turned on a lathe. That makes it much easier to manufacture. The other thing that they've done is they've gone to a lot of stamped components on the gun. But it's more what they've done internally that sharpens this rifle as opposed to it being of lower quality and lower performance. Remington, in addition to having made this gun easier to make, they make it a better shooter. And the way they do that is by tightening up tolerances inside the gun. You could probably pull three or four gunsmiths and get different answers as to why they think the Model 700 can be made so accurate. Speaking as a layman, I would say it comes down to only two locking lugs. It's a lot easier to blueprint an action, if you will, and true up those two lugs and their mating in the chamber. It's a lot simpler to mate those two lugs than it is, say, five lugs, or nine lugs, or seven lugs. It's just a lot simpler process. The commercial market isn't the only area where the Model 700 takes off. Uh, the military in the 1960s and in the 1970s is looking for a purpose-built bolt-action precision rifle. The sniping program in the U.S. military uh, has kind of covered the gamut from you know, the M1903A4 to uh, sniper variants of the M1 Garand to unofficial variants of the Model 70, uh, but they need something that's more purpose-built. And for the U.S. Army in particular, this emerges as the M24. And these are the guns that carry military sniping into the 21st century. Uh, these guns really start to emerge as uh, cornerstones of the United States military sniping program in the 1980s and uh, carries through to the present day in a lot of respects. These are guns that are still being fielded. They've been modernized uh, into variants such as the M2010 sniper system, but at the core, they're still the Model 700 that was first debuted in 1962. The U.S. Marine Corps was an early adopter of the Model 700 as a sniping rifle. Um, my friend, Major Edward J. Jim Land, uh, was, was involved in the adoption of the Marine Corps' M40 sniper rifle. Uh, and this is 
basically a, a heavy barrel wooden stocked model 700 and the M40 goes through a series of evolutions you end up with the M40A1 uh, you go from a wood stock probably not the best thing to have in the jungles of Vietnam uh, to a synthetic stock to a Macmillan and then you end up with the M40A2, M40A3 and the US Marine Corps has been using versions of the M40 since the 1960s the difference for the Marine Corps though especially uh, with the A2 was these guns are made by Marine Corps gunsmiths in Quantico, Virginia at the Precision Weapons Center. So unlike the Army, which just buys a, a complete package from Remington in a box, the U.S. Marine Corps builds its own guns with its own gunsmiths. Remington really created the Model 700 to be their, their flagship rifle, and that's exactly what it turned into. It turned into one of the two most successful firearms the company has ever made in its entire history.